الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. All praise due to Allah. And may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. Attaining inner peace in times of trial speaks about or addresses how we as individuals, as a community, can achieve the equilibrium, the balance which distinguishes the believers from the disbelievers. Allah describes us as Ummatan Wasata, the middle nation, the nation that has the balance, that is in harmony with Allah's creation. Inner peace is an expression of this harmony. And there is a particular hadith from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in which he laid for us the foundation for the equilibrium. The foundation for the equilibrium was exemplified in the Islamic maxim, win-win. The win-win maxim was expressed by Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in a hadith narrated by Suhaib ibn Sinan in which the Prophet ﷺ said عَجَبًا لِأَمْرِ الْمُؤْمِنِ إِنَّ أَمْرَهُ كُلَّهُ لَهُ خَيْرٌ The affair of the believer is amazing. The whole of his life is beneficial. وَلَيْسَ ذَلِكَ لِأَحَدٍ إِلَّا لِلْمُؤْمِنِ and that is only in the case of the believer. In asabatu sarra shakara fakana khairun lah. When good times come to him, he is thankful and it is good for him. Wa in asabatu darra sabara fakana khairun lah. And when bad times befall him, he is patient and it is good for him. This is the win-win maxim as divinely revealed. It addresses two essential elements in human life necessary to achieve the harmony. Harmony within the individual, harmony within the family, Balance within the community, within the nations. The two key elements are gratitude and patience. Gratitude and patience. When good times come to the believers, they are thankful. And as such, they are rewarded. And when bad times befall them, when trials befall them, they are patient and they are rewarded. Gratitude is praised in the Quran and in the Sunnah. In many verses and in many hadiths, just to mention one from each, from the Quran in Surah Ibrahim, verse 7, 
la in shakartum la azidannakum if you give thanks i will give you more the more thanks you give the more you get and from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said any servant who is blessed by allah and says alhamdulillah that is thanks to allah will be given better than what he has just received ma an'ama allah ala abdin ni'matan fa qala alhamdulillah illa kana alladhi a'tahu afdhal mimma akhadh any servant who is blessed by allah and says alhamdulillah will be given better than what he has just received on the other hand the opposite of gratitude ingratitude is dispraised in the quran and in the sunnah there are many texts which speak against it which warn against it in the quran that ingratitude is even referred to as kufr disbelief a form of kufr kufr an ni'ma allah says in the same chapter that we looked at ibrahim verse 7 wala in kafartum inna adhabi la shadid but if you disbelieve indeed my punishment will be severe if you give thanks i will give you more and if you don't give thanks that is if you disbelieve you don't recognize what i have given you then my punishment will be severe and from the sunnah prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in a hadith narrated in sunan at-tirmidhi authentically man lam yashkur an-nas lam yashkur Allah whoever does not thank people does not thank Allah one who doesn't thank people does not thank Allah cannot thank Allah because much of what is given us is given through people Allah chooses people as the means by which his mercy his grace his beneficence is bestowed on us so by not thanking those people we are in fact not thanking Allah though some people will say ashukru lillah thanks belongs to Allah these people are only means however the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us we must thank those people too yes we have to believe ultimately it's coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but we must thank people when Allah gives us things through them because that is a means of encouraging them to continue to do good Allah will give us whether we thank him or we don't thank him human beings will give us if we thank them but if we don't thank them they won't give us that's the nature of human beings so in order to encourage them to continue to do good we are obliged to thank them on the other hand patience also has a number of supporting texts in the quran and the sunna praising it we can find in surah al baqarah verse 155 wala nablu annakum bi shay'in min al khawf wal ju'i wa naqs min al amwal wal anfus wal thamarat wa bashir as sabirin and certainly i will test you with something of fear hunger loss of wealth lives and fruit but give glad tidings to the patient give glad tidings to the patient glad tidings of what of paradise and from the sunna prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam had said in a hadith which is narrated in sahih al bukhari 
ما أعطي أحد عطاء عطاء خيرا وأوسع من الصبر. No one has been given a gift better or vaster than patience. No one has been given a gift better or vaster than patience. This is why patience is mentioned as one of the keys for success in this world in Surah Al-Asr. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ All human beings will fail in this life except for those who believe in Allah. Call each other to and do righteous deeds. Call each other to the truth and call each other to patience. Remind each other to be patient. And on the other hand, impatience, its opposite, has been dispraised in both the Qur'an and in the Sunnah. In the Qur'an, Allah describes the human state as an impatient state, saying, وَيَدْعُ الْإِنسَانُ بِالشَّرِّ دُعَاءَهُ بِالْخَيْرِ وَكَانَ الْإِنسَانُ عَجُولًا the human being prays for evil in his prayers for good. The human being is forever impatient. In his impatience, he prays for evil in his prayers for good. Instead of waiting, instead of being content, his impatience leads him to pray for what he thinks to be good, but in fact it is evil. Allah didn't give it to him because it wasn't good for him, but he is demanding it. Give me anyway. I know what's good for me. His impatience is his destruction. From the sunnah, there is a narration reported in both Sahih al-Bukhari and Muslim and Sunnah al-Tirmidhi. Abu Huraira related that Allah's Messenger said, Any man who calls on Allah or woman who calls on Allah in prayer will be answered. Any man or woman who calls on Allah in prayer their prayer will be answered. It is either granted to him or her in advance in this life. It is either granted to him or her in advance in this life or stored away for him or her in the next life. It is either granted in advance in this life or stored for him or her in the next life. As long as, there's a condition, as long as he or she does not pray for something sinful, as long as they don't pray for something sinful, or for breaking family ties, or for breaking family ties, Mother and dad are upset with son or daughter and they pray to Allah to break those family ties. Not accepted by Allah. And as long as he or she is not impatient. As long as he or she is not impatient. When the companions of the Prophet ﷺ asked him, how is one impatient with regards to dua? How is one impatient? He replied by saying, I called on my Lord and he did not answer my prayer for me. I called on my Lord and he did not answer my prayer for me. So one who expresses this, will not have their prayer answered. 
in patience, in dua, will cancel Allah's accepting that dua. That is how serious impatience can be. We all know as Muslims that gratitude and patience are basic principles which each and every one of us must develop. They were exemplified in the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he prayed at night till his ankles were swollen and his wife, companions asked him, why are you doing this to yourself when Allah has forgiven your sins of the past and the sins of the future? And he said what? Shouldn't I be a thankful servant? Shouldn't I be a thankful servant? This was the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he went to carry the message to Ta'if, relatives of his there stoned him, chased him out of the city and stoned him. Stoning him until blood clogged his sandals. And when he was given the option to have that city destroyed, what did he say? Perhaps there would come a believing people from their children. He was patient. You and I, if that happened to us, we would have told the angel, yes, wipe him out. But Prophet Muhammad Wasallam looked positively into the future, saying perhaps a believing people would come from among them. So gratitude and patience should be a part of our characters as Muslims. It should be practically demonstrated in our families. It should be practically demonstrated in our communities on the world scale. There is so much which could be said about the importance of gratitude. Muslims today, unfortunately, with wealth, they have not shown gratitude. Instead, that wealth is used to enjoy. So busy enjoying that they have forgotten that this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they squander that wealth in all kinds of corruption, instead of using it to spread the word of Allah and to relieve Allah's servants in the earth. Similarly, in times of difficulty, when it comes, instead of depending on the believers, they depend on the disbelievers. They make the disbelievers their friends and their allies instead of the believers. This is ingratitude and impatience on an international scale. But taking it back down to the individual, how does one develop gratitude? If we are by nature unthankful, thankless, we have to be reminded, even as little children, we have to teach our children to be thankful. Otherwise, you give them something, they'll take it and they're gone, finish. They got it. <laughs> That's what's important. I got it. But we have to teach them, train them, raise them, to be thankful. So, how do we, if we have reached adulthood, and we don't display proper gratitude in our lives, how do we bring it into our lives? Because we need to 
understand practically how we can change ourselves to make a difference. Well, for gratitude, fundamentally, it involves recognition of Allah's favors. As Allah said in Surah Nahal, As Allah said in Surah Nahal, وَمَا بِكُمْ مِن نِعْمَةٍ فَمِنَ اللَّهِ Whatever blessings you have are from Allah. Whatever blessings you have are from Allah. In Surah Al-Ahzab, verse 9, يَا هِيُوَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أُذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ O you who believe, remember Allah's favor on you. Remember Allah's favor on you. There's a stress on reflecting on the favors of Allah. And from the sunnah, Prophet Muhammad wasallam had said, انظروا إلى من أسفل منكم ولا تنظروا إلى من هو فوقكم Look at those who are less fortunate than you and not those above you فهو أجدر أن لا تزدر نعمة الله عليكم It is better for you in order that you do not deny what Allah has blessed you with. Look at those less fortunate than you, those below you, and not those above you. It is better for you in order that you do not deny what Allah has blessed you with. In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ had said, if you look at one who is above you, then look at one who is below you. Because we can't help it. We told us, Generally, don't look to those above you. But we can't help it. Somebody drives by with a new car. Well, that's nice. But the Prophet ﷺ said, knowing that this is our nature, you see that new car, go look at the old car. And your car, you know, is in between. You know? So though our nature will cause us to look at those above us, Prophet ﷺ told us always, whenever that happens, the remedy for it, so it doesn't go into our hearts and then drives us to want whatever anybody else wants, has. This is what the society is promoting. Look at what we have. Look at what the rich and the famous have. So that we don't feel satisfied, we don't feel contented with what we have. Even though what we have is much more than many people in this world. But we are driven to want to have what they have. So we get credit cards, we live on credit, and there's a, a sickness. Unfortunately, many Muslims are caught up in it. On the other hand, patience. How does one gain patience? This is perhaps the more difficult one. Gratitude, we have been trained to be grateful as Muslims, our parents reminded us growing up, etc. But patience, this one is most difficult. Why? Because it is not just recognizing something, you have to do something. Recognizing Allah's favor makes you grateful. But what do you do to make yourself patient? Most of us, we say, well, you know, how? There are some people you know who are very patient. You say, they've been blessed by Allah. But how do I become patient? In fact, Western thought promoted impatience. That we don't be patient. When things upset you, what do you do? Control yourself and be patient? No. Fly off the handle. 
explode. Get it off your chest. That's what they say. Because if you keep it inside, you know, it's boiling around inside there, it's going to hurt you. So better you let it off, let off steam, explode. Recently, neurologists studying the effects of explosions of this type on the brain found that it isn't better to get it off your chest. Because every time you explode, small capillaries, small blood vessels in the brain burst. They burst. I mean, you can see an angry person, you can see all the veins and everything sticking out of their necks. So, so you can imagine the very small blood vessels, very small ones whose linings very, very thin. Sure enough, bursting in the brain. It's not good. So what the Prophet Sallallahu said, لا تغضب, Don't get angry. He was right. And if you're angry when you're standing, sit down. And if you're still angry, lie down. This was the advice of the Prophet Sallallahu Don't let it out. So how then does one become patient? In a hadith, narrated by Abu Sa'id al-Khudri found in Sahih al-Bukhari the Prophet sallam said man yatasabbar yusabbirhu Allah man yatasabbar yusabbirhu Allah whoever feigns patience he pretends to be patient. Allah will give him patience. This is a prophetic formula. One might say this is hypocrisy. You're pretending to be patient and exploding inside. This is hypocrisy. But the Prophet ﷺ said, no. You pretend to be patient knowing that patience is what is best, what, what Allah has commanded, struggling with it, then eventually you will gain that patience. In another narration from Aisha radiallahu anha, she quotes the Prophet as saying, In ahab al amali ilallahi ma dama wa in qal. Indeed, the best most beloved deeds to Allah is the one done consistently or constantly even if it is small. The one done constantly, consistently even if it is small. So, practicing patience Pretending to be patient, done on a continual basis, consistently, it will create in the individual patience, ultimately. And this is a general rule for all of the various characteristics that a Muslim should display. All of them. It is a principle addressed to patience, which is among the most difficult of characteristics to develop, but it's a general principle for all. Generosity, for example. This is difficult. Our nature is to be stingy, to keep for ourselves. But if we pretend to be generous, we force ourselves to do acts of generosity. At first it may feel very uh, contrived, very unreal, you feel fake, phony, counterfeit. But doing it continually, regularly, eventually 
Allah puts it in your heart. And so on and so forth. So even when we come to prayer, when we hear of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and his companions praying and crying in their prayers, and we ask ourselves, why don't we cry in our prayers? How does one cry in his prayers? Something missing in our lives. We cry over a lot of other things. When you get a new car, and those jealous people around you see it, and they come out and they slash all four of your tires, you come out, you break down into tears. Very easily. Over material things, very easy to cry. But to cry for Allah in prayer, this one we find so difficult. So how? We do it by forcing ourselves to cry. Forcing ourselves to cry. Artificially. Not bawling, you know, so it becomes a scene that you're showing off to people. You know, people hear you in your prayer. No, no, no. Not like this. When you're on your own, when you're praying tahajjud, try to get up for tahajjud, then try to force yourself to cry. Try to think about some things in our lives which we are ashamed of, something we know Allah knows about, we really shouldn't have done it, we feel bad about it, and by pressing ourselves, eventually some tears will come. And if we do this on a regular basis, we try to do it from time to time consistently, then our hearts will soften. So all of the characteristics which we tend to think, that was the Sahaba. You know, we are 2006 UK. How can you expect this from us? Reality is that Islam is Islam. Islam is Islam. 1,400 years ago, 1,400 years hence, it's the same Islam. Everything that was possible in those days is possible now and will be possible in the future. It is only for us to follow the guidance and to do it. Inner peace is what the world seeks. We have it. If we only take it, it's been given to us. It is there in Islam. But we are living the same search as the non-Muslims. So we seek the inner peace from the material things around ourselves. If I get a big car, a big house, kids, lots of money in the bank, I will be happy. I will find my inner peace. Reality is no. It will not come from these things. Inner peace is something, it is an affair of the heart. A person can find inner peace with nothing, having nothing of the material world. Yet inner peace is there. So, what we need to come away from, or come away with today, from this presentation, is a practical approach to developing in our lives gratitude and patience. Gratitude and patience which should be manifest in our families, in our workplace, 
in our places of study, everywhere that we are, it should be there with us. But for that to take place, we have to make a change. That requires change. We cannot continue the way we have done up until this point. A change has to take place in our lives. These points that I've mentioned, gratitude and patience, is something that I'm sure you have heard a thousand times before. Maybe not exactly in the same way that I presented it, but you've had lectures on patience, you've had lectures on gratitude, and now I give you a lecture on gratitude and patience. So, we have to ask ourselves, why did we come here today in this conference? Did we come here for entertainment? Many people go to conferences for entertainment, to be entertained. We have a new speaker coming, we have a different speaker coming, whatever, he's going to entertain us. Spiritual entertainment. But nonetheless, for entertainment. Some people come to socialize. Meet people we haven't met for the last few months or whatever. Good to see them, sit around, eat a meal, chat about life and things, etc. Socializing. Some people come because of peer pressure. All my friends are going, I gotta go. I don't really feel like going, but since everybody is going, I may as well go too. Some people come to conferences for what? For romance. Mm -hmm. There are people who come to conferences for romance. Maybe they might see a sister. Or meet a brother who has a sister. So they're coming to the conference for romance. To get married. Other people come, in this case, for example, to see BP. Who's BP? Bilal Phillips. We haven't seen him for a year. You know? Let's see what he looks like now. A year later. Come to see the speaker. Say, oh, I saw him. Heard his lectures and I never saw, seen him before. Oh, I got a chance to see him there. Some people come because they know that the conference is a good thing. So they've been doing a lot of bad things. So let me go do a good thing to erase some of those bad things. And then some people come to boost their Iman. Iman is low when they come, they hear the speaker, etc. Iman comes up. It rises. They're around other people who are keen, etc. Or they hear them speaking good or speaking things about Islam, etc. That boosts their Iman. So people come for a variety of different reasons. But reality is, if we didn't come prepared to make a change, this evening will be a waste of time. This evening will be a waste of time. Time wasted, which we will be asked about on the Day of Judgment. Your time and how you spent it. Time wasted. If we didn't come prepared to make a change. Without that, we practice what the psychologists call obsessive behavior. Obsessive behavior. What is obsessive behavior? 
where you keep doing the same thing while expecting different results. You did the thing, you didn't get the result you should have gotten. You did it again, you still didn't get the result you should have gotten. You keep doing this thing over and over again, expecting a different result. But in reality, if you keep doing the same thing, you will keep getting the same result. They also call this banging your head against the wall. Huh? This is a syndrome, banging your head against the wall. The wall is not going to break. Your head's going to hurt every time you bang it on the wall. This is called obsessive behavior. Psychological disorder. This is what we are displaying. We come to conference after conference after conference. And we go back unchanged. The same way we were before the conference. During the conference, yes, we felt this way and that way and all. But after the conference, we're back to where we were. Till the next conference. Isn't this obsessive behavior? The only way out of this is change. That is the only way for us to change. But what's the problem about changing? People say change takes a long time. Rome wasn't built in a day. Takes a long time to change. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. Leopard doesn't change its spots. There are all kinds of statements basically saying you can't change. But reality is that we do change. We change in other ways. And in fact, change is instantaneous. If you think about it, change is actually takes place instantaneously. Because there is a moment in time when you either started doing something you weren't doing or you stopped doing something you were doing. It was a moment. A moment in time. Prior to that moment, you used to do this thing. After that moment, you no longer did it. Prior to that moment, you didn't used to do this thing. After that moment, you now do it. You can remember when you started doing this particular thing. So change itself is instantaneous. So what is it that takes time? What is it that takes a long time? If it isn't change, what is it? Tell me. Preparation, yeah. Getting ready to change. Making up our minds to actually change. Getting away from saying, I'll think about it. Inshallah. Sometime, one day. This is what takes a long time. This is what takes a a long time. The day when we decided to grow our beards. It was that day. We stopped shaving. Stopped using the razor. Finish. The grip, beard started to grow. But to decide that we were going to stop shaving. That's what took time. So many things working against us. Parents saying you don't look good. At your workplace saying, no, that's not professional. The wife saying, it's uncomfortable, stubble. 
Everything around you saying don't. But you reached a point where you said, well, this is what the Prophet ﷺ said. I have to obey him. And I'm going to do it regardless. This is what we have to walk away with today. We have to walk away with a decision to make a change in our lives. To make gratitude and patience reality. To find that inner peace. Whereby our hearts are touched when we hear the Quran. Whereby our eyes fill with tears when we pray. Whereby we truly fear Allah. Taqwa becomes a reality. So, my brothers, to help us on the way. And this principle of change applies to all of the things that we have to do. It is the same principle we have to look at when we consider Ramadan. Ramadan which is around the corner. Preparing for Ramadan. I had a talk which I was supposed to give today on preparing for Ramadan. But it's, the principle is here. It's the same thing. Same thing I was going to talk about. Ramadan to Ramadan. Have we changed? Is there any difference? We pray more during Ramadan, but as soon as we come out of Ramadan, it's the same. We're back to where we were. Obsessive behavior. Salah, obsessive behavior. We keep banging our heads on the ground. And in the end, it hasn't changed us. Though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Inna salah tanha anil fahsha wal munkar. Indeed, salah, regular prayer, prevents evil speech and evil deeds. But we are cursing, swearing, Telling lies, slandering, evil speech continues. And our evil deeds continue. All of this because we have not committed ourselves to change. And Islam is about change. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, In Allah la yughayru ma biqawmin, Indeed, Allah will not change a people, the condition of a people, until they change what is in themselves. It is about change. So we have to change our attitudes. We have to change our habits. We have to walk away from this conference with a clear commitment to change. To change in accordance with the Quran and the Sunnah. So we read the Quran, pondering over its meanings. Not reading it ritualistically in a parrot fashion. We seek knowledge sincerely. We seek to find out about the religion. Because that knowledge is the foundation of the faith. Without proper knowledge, we will be subject to the tricks and the traps of Satan. There are many sincere people in this world but sincerely astray. Knowledge. 
Seeking knowledge is an obligation. The opportunity is here. We have this masjid in our midst. There are programs prepared, lessons that we can take advantage of. For us not to do so is ultimately only to harm ourselves. And we need to reflect on death. We need to reflect on death. The Prophet ﷺ called it the destroyers of pleasures. The pleasure destroyer. When we reflect on death, the pleasures of this life lose their allure. They're not so beautiful anymore. So, we need to go to the graveyards. We need to follow the dead, when we come to the masjid, when somebody's janazah prayer is being said, follow them. Go to the graveyards. Get the reward. Get the spiritual benefit. And we need to be in the company of the righteous. Those who are patient. Those who display gratitude in their actions. Who fear Allah. So it can rub off on us. And we need to do as many righteous deeds as we can. Not considering any righteous deed too small to do. Nor considering any sin too small to be considered. Prophet Muhammad said, Iyakum Beware of the scorned sins, the little sins. Where we say, it is only a small sin. I'm doing so many other good things, that small sin, Allah is Ghafur Rahim. But what we may consider to be small, Allah may consider to be big. So, my brothers and sisters, I ask you this evening, I ask you to make a commitment along with me. A commitment to change. All those, and we are here in the house of Allah, all those ready to make a change from this evening onwards, a real change in their lives, in our lives, sisters and brothers, raise your right hand. This is before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I ask Allah to give us the tawfiq to make it happen. Barakallah feekum.